The first Neiman Marcus opened in 1907. It offered clothing never before available to the good people of Dallas, all at a time when pockets were filling to the brim with oil money. Founded by Herbert Marcus, his sister Carrie Marcus Neiman and her husband A. L. Neiman, they promised to deliver satisfaction, not just clothes. Herbert's son Stanley later ran the company as it expanded across the United States, providing customers with luxury goods from around the world. Necklaces, dresses and the unique high-end items in its famous Christmas catalogue. Elegant, Texas with a French noise. accent is how Vogue described the company. I visited the original Neiman Marcus in downtown Dallas. This store itself, magnificent. This is the first. This is the first and the original one. But you still keep it downtown where there's not the same footfall, there's not the same business, there's not the same traffic. I mean, it's why? Emotionally, why? It's emotionally important. We have the, the store here, we have the restaurant on the sixth floor, and families come here to celebrate Christmas with Santa, to celebrate graduations. It, it is a tradition, and it's a tradition that is multi-generational. And so we, we keep it because our customers love it. Right, but you're a businessman. Oh, Does it, is it worth keeping? Every single one of our stores is profitable. This one is, and because it is uh, dear to our best customers, it actually does quite well. You had a really, really bad early pandemic, didn't you? You know, it's, it's all, all about how you look at it. For me, the pandemic... Bankruptcy is, is not a difficult way to look at it. No, it's a strategic choice to repurpose and reshape your balance sheet, which allows you post-bankruptcy to have the least debt in the industry to have a bank, the available liquidity that allows you to invest in your business. If you look at where we are today, it's the best time we've ever been in terms of recruiting new clients, having growth to pre-pandemic and more profitability than pre-pandemic. That whole period of closing Hudson Yards and going into bankruptcy for financial reasons creates an aura that the fundamental business is in trouble. And if I understand what you're saying is that's not the case. That's not the case at all. And I think it's good that we changed that aura. Pre-pandemic, we were generating 430 million of EBITDA. We were growing for nine quarters. Post-pandemic, we're generating more EBITDA than pre-pandemic. And we're growing, the last quarter we reported at high single digit. And we're seeing a tremendous growth of new customers and a tremendous growth specifically in men, which I think is very promising for the US market. This idea, products that you don't necessarily need but you desperately want, that's what you sell. Yes, that is what we sell. We sell a dream, a dream about the integrity of the product. We dream, sell a dream about the craftsmanship that goes into it and what it makes you feel. We, I always say we're not in a world of transaction. We're in a world of emotions and that, that's really what we do. And you play on those emotions. Oh, we totally play on the emotions. On, what does it make you feel to wear this beautiful product, to carry these beautiful handbags? We do 40% of our sales with customers who spend more than $10,000 a year with us. These people enjoy a luxury lifestyle and they trust us as the guide and the curator of that lifestyle. This post-pandemic, tell me, just tell me the story again about you know, the new customer. Well, what we saw during the pandemic is an increase of new customers, 20% up to pre-pandemic. And it's really a customer who has a new disposable income. They can travel, they cannot go out. And so they're deciding and being influenced by digital inspiration that they want a special sneaker. They want a special sweater. And they come and spend much more than they've ever spent. We can tell the difference between you and me. Do tell. <laughs> I mean... I know, I, I think you can get there. I think you, you've got... I don't... I, mean, I think I, you can I'm, pull it out. I'm feeling highly insecure now. The nature of this luxury store is that it... A lot of people will feel it... Either I can't afford to shop there or it's not for me. Because when I walk through the door, I can only afford to buy a lipstick or even something small. So I'm not trying to sell you one thing. I'm in the business of a relationship. I'm in the business of building a relationship so that you come back. But wherever your entry point is not what matters. 
what matters is the relationship that I can make you come back. Let's talk about the fantasy gift and the whole, the, the Christmas list and all that. Where did it begin? It started almost 60 years ago. It started with Stanley Marcus, and we are in his former offices. Behind me is the suspenders he had in his closet. It, it's a special place here, and his spirit is very much there. What he created was the notion of when it's the holidays, we should celebrate it with fantasy, because that's the dream we have. And so he had crazy gifts. The one that I love is uh, a camel that was available for sale. A woman in Fort Worth bought it, and it got delivered on Christmas Day. You don't need a camel, but how cool is it to have a camel run into your, your garden? Have you ever said, no, 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 either that's ridiculous or no, that's too expensive? I, I've said no to ideas that I thought were not ours, that you could find it somewhere else. So the criteria for me is that it has to be emotional, unique, and only us could provide it. If it is something that is available at anywhere else, then that, that is not a fantasy gift for Neiman Marcus.